uh, really uh, delighted that you're here. Uh, and uh, it's a particular pleasure to welcome our uh, very distinguished guest, uh, Jacob Rees Mogg. Um, he's uniquely qualified, really, to talk on uh, the subject we've asked him to talk on investing in emerging markets and the political implications of a post Brexit world, because he is both a leading member of the government, of course, and an investment banker. So he knows the subject area. And it's very good that you've been able to be with us this evening, Jacob. Thank you. I've known uh, Jacob for some time because he was at Oxford with my son Giles. And uh, I do remember a, a time when he, as a very youthful candidate, was fighting the Rekin by-election in 2001. Um, it was not a successful venture, but that was at the height of the Blair uh, ascendancy in uh, politics. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think your defeat in many ways uh, paved the way for a successful um, arrival in Parliament as a member for a Somerset seat, the Northeast Division of Somerset, your home county, to enable you to represent your home people. And I do think it's a delight uh, that you are representing the people you come from. Living there with a uh, wife and uh, six children, the sixth of which is appropriately called Sixtus, uh, but it's very good that uh, you have a family uh, so large. In that, uh, at any rate, you've already exceeded uh, your father's achievement with a mere five. Um, famous uh, uh, sons of famous fathers do find it difficult sometimes, but it's very good. And uh, he would be very proud of your achievement, I have to say. Uh, immediately, when you got into Parliament, you're on key committees which have uh, enabled you to really play a part uh, that you now currently do in uh, Parliament, the Scrutiny Committee, um, the EU um, uh, uh, Scrutiny Committee, Procedure Committee, Treasury Committee, and uh, exiting the EU Committee. All things which have led, really, to you being uh, appointed to the key role by Boris Johnson in his new government as leader of the Commons and pres Lord President of the Council. The leader is responsible for organising the business of the House of Commons and uh, uh, with the additional responsibility of the Privy Council, uh, you preside over that. And that gives uh, advice and provides um, business to the Queen for her approval. And no other job shows, actually, uh, the way we are um, under the Queen's government and uh, represented by the Queen's Parliament as the job that you hold. It's recess, and uh, as I was speaking to you earlier, I, I know from my own five years um, in uh, one of the four BMs, the business managers that uh, are responsible for government business, um, that there's no rest uh, for our wicked ways. And recesses are uh, times of activity and we do very much appreciate you taking uh, this evening to uh, spend with us. So we're looking forward to this evening and uh, what you've got to say for us and for agreeing to ask, answer questions um, at the conclusion. But over to you, Jacob. Thank you. Well, John, thank you so much um, for your kind introduction. Uh, but also it's an opportunity to thank you. As, as you said, I've known you for a long time, initially through Giles and then in the Rekin, where you were so amazingly helpful because uh, we had the problem that the Rekin Conservatives were divided in two. We had the Rekin Conservative Association and the Conservatives in the Rekin. And there were about three people that both sides would speak to. I was one of them. I had a fantastic agent, Margaret Chellingworth, who was another. And you were the third. 
and you were the absolute master of pouring oil on troubled waters and making it possible for me as candid to get on with what I was supposed to be doing. And your, your calmness, your sensitivity, and your devotion to the Conservative Party made my life as candid possible in what was um, a sticky wicket in many ways, and, and stickier in terms of the Conservative Association than it was in terms of the electorate, which was quite bad enough in the height of the Blair years. So it's a chance to thank you um, for that, but for all you've done for the Conservative Party, I'm sure everyone on this call knows that you have been one of the greatest servants of the Conservative Party uh, in recent decades. There's hardly a thing you haven't done for the Voluntary Party, and the Voluntary Party is the lifeblood of conservatism, in my view. It's how uh, conservative ideas feed through to government activity. Um, and so thank you for all you've done. Thank you for inviting me this evening. And I'm delighted to have a chance to talk a little bit more broadly than I normally do uh, about emerging markets, because that was my career before and during my period in politics until I got into to government. Um, I was an emerging markets fund manager for many years, set up my own emerging markets business in 2007, uh, lived in Hong Kong for a few years looking at emerging markets. And so it's an area that remains of great interest to me. And it ties in both economics and politics, which I suppose are pretty fundamental to how any country is governed and how the global system operates. And I thought it might be worth drawing together some thoughts on that and how we benefit from it, what you want to look at in terms of investment opportunities and how politics affects investment for better and for worse. And there are some fascinating things to bear in mind. The fastest growing economy from the 1930s through to the 1960s was the Soviet Union. Now, this is absolutely amazing because those of us who are conservatives and capitalists look at the Soviet Union and we think, well, how could that possibly have happened? Wow. How could a country so centrally controlled going through a major and destructive war have been the fastest growing economy for three decades? Well, the answer is very simple. Percentages when you're starting at zero are inevitably very high. And the Soviet economy at the beginning of the 1930s had been reduced basically to nothing. And so going from nothing to industrialization led to incredibly high economic growth, which proved unsustainable in the end because the politics didn't work with it to allow for that second stage of growth. And so when you're looking at emerging markets and you're looking at economic development, you initially see that there is no difference between a totalitarian state and a democratic state, a state that has the rule of law and a state that doesn't have the rule of law. Because when you're starting from an agrarian subsistence economy, any opening up is likely to lead to enormous growth rates. Now, that becomes an opportunity for investors to some extent if foreign investment is allowed, but it's also a very considerable risk. And if you want to look at perhaps the extreme example of this over the post-war period, it's North and South Korea. You have two economies that grew reasonably similarly for the initial period after the Korean War. The North Korean economy is supported by Russia and by China. The South Korean economy is supported by the United States, still has a uh, home to a large uh, US military base, uh, but opening up and becoming more democratic as time went on. So by the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, South Korea is moving on a democratic path with the rule of law and welcomes foreign investment. Very early in my career, I was actually the South Korean analyst for the firm I worked for. So I used to go there quite a bit as it was beginning to open up. And in those early days, it was fascinating because You'd go and see companies that had PE multiples of price to cash multiples more than price to earnings as it happens because they, they paid tax on their declared earnings. So they always wanted to keep them low. But price to cash at two to three times. And the people you'd go and see would, would say, why do you want to see my company? Why could my company in South Korea possibly be of interest to you? 
And the answer was obvious because it was good value and you were being allowed to invest there. There was an incredible opportunity to go somewhere where you had the rule of law and a stable political system. North Korea, on the other hand, went into a more and more totalitarian spiral with the economy um, failing completely with terrible conditions for the people, with starvation and with emergency supplies being supplied in the end by the West. Not that we got any thanks for it. As I'm sure you know, uh, in North Korea, they received emergency supplies from America, which were stamped with um, US on them. And the North Koreans said, this is what we've won by conquering uh, against the US. And they maintained that it wasn't aid, it was from their success as an organization against the feeble West. And of course that wasn't true and the people of North Korea have suffered. So what lessons do you learn from this for more active, more current um, emerging market investment? Well, I was actually talking to a great friend of mine who I was in business with for many years, who was over in the UK just relatively briefly. Um, uh, and, and I saw him on uh, Wednesday night and we worked together and he then set up his own firm. He said to me rather modestly that since he'd set up his own firm, he'd done quite well, but he hadn't blown the lights out. This meant he'd compounded 11% per annum in dollar terms since 2007. So if 11% compound per annum since 2007 isn't blowing the lights out, I don't know what is. So he's modest, very well informed. And, and we were discussing this in relation to the investment opportunities in India and in China. And the difficulty with China is that it doesn't have the rule of law. So if you invest in the um, dot-com companies that are Chinese listed, you don't in fact own them. You own a potential right to own them if the law changes to allow you to own them. Whereas when you invest in India, you have real and genuine ownership. And when you invest in India, you have a court that will enforce your ownership ultimately. You have a proudly independent judiciary uh, in India that um, like many legal systems isn't exactly fast, but is nonetheless one that has a proud legal tradition based on the common law and eventually gives its judgments. In China, you have the decision of the Communist Party that no judgment is made of any importance without the approval of the Communist Party. So if you're investing in China, you're taking a risk on continued growth, but you're also taking a risk on the rights of property to start with. But it's of course more than that, because the second great protection of investors is freedom of speech. Because in a country that has freedom of speech, if getting a license requires paying a bribe, or if um, um, licenses are taken away from you, if intellectual property isn't treated properly, or if your factory is suddenly overrun, you have an ability to say this to people. You have the ability to go on the news and say this terrible thing has happened. And that gives you a protection because politicians are sensitive to what is uh, in the news, as I'm sure everyone on this call is only too well aware. So when you're looking at investing, rights of property are essential, but so is freedom of speech, because it is freedom of speech that allows you to highlight that your rights of property may be being affected. And so if you invest in a country that doesn't have freedom of speech and doesn't have rights of property, you are piling risk on top of risk. And absolutely, you may do very well when the economy is going from zero, when it's going from um, the iron bowl, rice bowl policy of Chairman Mao to the opening up that came through Deng and so on. But you don't have these key things that protect you uh, as an investor and you don't have the rule of law to enforce the judgments. And of course, you don't have a democratic system that will allow new politicians to come in if the old ones fail. And this is important in long-term investing, but not necessarily in short-term investing. And this is the dilemma that I no longer face, but if I was still in business, I would face very much, is that though the issues that I've mentioned make long-term investing in a country very risky because you don't have the protections that you would hope for. In the short term, 
a lot of money may be going into the country that you're cautious of over the long term. And you may find that you're outcompeted by all your other fund manager friends and um, competitors because they've taken the short term investment decision and they're benefiting from the growth that you get when you're going from a very low level and you appear to being left, be, be left behind. So you face this conundrum of do you take a long term view and stick to those countries where you are absolutely certain of your property rights or are you willing to take the risk that it will unravel during the short term that you think there is a, a market opportunity. And at the moment, if you've taken the cautious approach on China over the last year or two, you have underperformed the markets. So it's a fundamental decision to make. Do you put long term against short term? And then you have to think about day to day politics. And this is another very interesting part of emerging market investment, because over many years, I used to invest in Thailand. And many people on this call will know that Thailand periodically has a coup. And you would think that when there's a coup, this would be pretty bad for investment. But very often, political changes don't make any difference to the investment environment. And so you could see governments change in Thailand with the army coming in with almost no economic effect. Now there's a long-term effect because the army taking charge tends not to lead to the most efficient allocation of assets, tends to undermine the rule of law, tends to reduce freedom of speech, all those things that I've mentioned that are important. But on a day-to-day -day basis, um, a volatile political situation may not have any direct economic impact. So politics is, in my view, fundamental in long-term investing. It's fundamental to the foundations of the society in which you are dealing, but it's remarkably unimportant in short-term investing. And that is the dilemma that um, investors face when they're looking at emerging markets. Now, there are further lessons that you can draw. I think the great opportunity for all markets and this is important for us too, is trade. That if you look at, and this is currently very topical, um, government support, government schemes to support countries, and you look at trade flows, what has made countries rich and successful is trade flows, not government aid. If you look at where government aid has tended to go, it hasn't been to Korea and to Malaysia uh, and to Taiwan all of which have done amazingly successfully through trading, it's tended to go to countries that have actually continued to be held back. And this is really fundamental because we all look at South Korea now as an OECD member and say, well, it's very rich and that's all splendid. At the end of the Korean War, South Korea in GDP per capita terms was poorer than Somaliland. And this is so interesting because what has led to Korea being prosperous is because it's been able to trade and it's been willing to trade both ways. It's been willing to buy goods from outside, but it's also been very good at selling things to us at a competitive price. Um, and this has applied across the uh, Asian emerging markets, which have been the particularly strong traders. And China is a very strong example uh, for all my concerns about the structures that it has constitutionally and therefore its long-term sustainability, what has really made China prosper is its ability to trade. Likewise, uh, India, though it came to it late because you will remember that the um, immediate post-war years, India had a self-sufficiency policy that went on pretty much through until the end of the 1980s and it began to be withdrawn in the 1990s, had very high tariff barriers, which held back its economic growth. But once it started to trade, um, its prosperity increased enormously. And trade is always beneficial to the person who reduces tariffs most. That actually, if you take tariffs off, you help your consumers and your businesses so much that you generate domestic demand that helps you even if there are tariff barriers remaining against the goods that you sell into other markets. One way free trade 
is a one-way ticket to prosperity. Two-way free trade is a two-way ticket to prosperity, but it's the other side that benefits uh, as, as well. And um, you, you, you mentioned, John, that as um, the, a business manager, um, things still go on under recess. One of them is in relation to statutory instruments, which pass across the business management, manager's desk. Uh, and there's one where we still have a 14% tariff on imported tropical fruits. Now, there aren't many tropical fruit growers, even in the balmy climate that is Somerset. And that type of tariff doesn't benefit anyone. And moving to freer trade is a fundamental opportunity for this country, but you see this in emerging markets. You see what has led them out of poverty is trade. And it's really stunning. If you look at the figures on global absolute poverty, people on under a dollar a day, that has gone down from over 50% of the global population in 1990 to um, under 10% now. This is a really stunning achievement by trade. It's mainly, of course, uh, growth in China and India. Those have been the big drivers of the reduction in absolute poverty, and it's been because of trade. And the other really interesting thing about this is investment flows. So my world of emerging markets investing portfolio flows, in recent years, between 800 and a trillion dollars a year has gone from the advanced world into developing economies by portfolio flows and direct investment. If you think how that compares with our overseas aid budget, you realize that it is private capital and private investment that matters, that public money, taxpayers' money being directed abroad is very small in comparison. So I think emerging markets still remain a great field of opportunity. I think they're an area that the UK should look at from a diplomatic perspective because these are going to be the relationships of the future. If I were going to take a bet, it wouldn't surprise me if India were our most important foreign affairs relationship by the end of this century, even more important than our relationship with the United States. And therefore we want to be building those sorts of relationships more and more now. We want to be looking at the investment opportunities but we also want to be leading by example. Free trade benefits everybody, and we will improve our relationships by opening up our economy further, and we will be um, helping other economies to see how much prosperity that brings to them too. Um, I'm not going to give specific investment advice because I'm too long out of the markets, and I'm not sure the FCA would like it if I did, uh, other than to say that investing in emerging markets for the best part of year 30 years was a very exciting thing to do. And if there's anyone here thinking of a future career, well, I think going into emerging markets is very rewarding um, intellectually as well as investment wise. I've probably spoken for long enough. The, the, the terrible difficulty with Zoom is I haven't a clue whether anyone's been listening at all or whether you've all been gently snoozing for the last few minutes. But if there are some questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Well, Jacob, I can tell you they've not been sleeping. I've been keeping an eye on them, and uh, everybody's been very alert. And there's been a lot in the chat. Um, now, I did talk earlier about um, uh, how we would sell the, a potential trade deal with Australia to uh, Somerset Pharma. But uh, the questions we've already had in uh, really uh, cover this sort of between protectionism and competition. Uh, but um, I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Hunter, who's um, a chairman of a technology company which has done extremely well in inventing um, stuff and selling it uh, during the, um, the pandemic, very much to his credit and to the credit of the country. Uh, so, Carl, if you care to handle the questions, we've got uh, uh, quite a few already. So, over to you. Uh, Lord Taylor, thank you as always for your grace. And uh, Jacob, th thank you to you and, and the Chief Whip, actually. I think the unsung heroes of the, of the pandemic. And 
I'd like to start by just thanking you and the government. I think you'll look back with great pride um, in how well you've done really over the last year or so, and, and I thank you. Now, we have got a lot of questions and nobody was in your talk at all. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, you might like to know that Melissa uh, has created this fine group and does so much for us. And, and I'd just like to thank her for um, inviting you this evening. But th thank you for what you're doing for the country. It's, it's a great pleasure to have you here. The first question this evening is from William, William Knight. And, and I just remind everybody that we have got a lot of uh, questions and we've got an equal number of comments coming in. And I'd like to try and cover them all, but we don't want to keep um, uh, Jacob too long. So William, we, your first question. Thank you, Jacob. As you know, I spent my entire life dealing with the emerging markets. So, uh, and of course, we, if we knew all about Korea and Russia, etc. My question sent in to Melissa earlier, I think is either being already covered or is going to be covered by uh, John Taylor, which relates to the trade agreement with uh, Australia and its importance and covering defence and 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 uh, and freedom of movement of people. But also, I think it, 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 if the question re relates to Somerset farmers and the effects that's going to have. So um, I won't ask the question I was going to ask. But if I could just quickly ask a, a general question, and that is, you mentioned India. And I was listening only yesterday to a, to a very good presentation on Bangladesh. What are your views on how we can grow and develop uh, trade with uh, Commonwealth countries generally? Uh, thank you. Um, th there's quite a lot of hiss on the line. So I wonder if I can make that boring announcement about asking everyone to mute who isn't speaking, please, because it might reduce it. That's better. It's all gone. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, William, good evening. How very kind of you to come and listen to me when you know far more about emerging markets than I do uh, and therefore would have been in a better position to, to, to give the talk. So I'm very flattered that you're, you're on the line. Um, uh, how do we make those relationships work? Well, I, I think we need to open our markets to them. I mean, I, I think we need to be generous that we want to get those economies going and we want to build relationships and we've got to invest in them. We've got to invest in them in terms of ensuring that we've got the highest quality representation in the embassies, that we are engaging, that we recognize where we have shared interests and work together, that there are political issues arising um, in that part of the world where we need to recognize who our friends are, who we can work with, and I think India is going to be our most important friend. And we need to um, know that. I'm sorry, I'm just turning my telephone off because it was ringing in the background. Um, and we, we, we need to work on that. But the best way to do it is by building economic ties. And of course, we have such an important diaspora from the, uh, the Indian subcontinent in the UK that we need to work with people who are here and build those relationships too. So it's personal relationships and business relationships that I think will be really important. Thank you. On that diaspora question, uh, Jacob, what, how would you actually how would you actually make that happen? Because I, I I entirely agree with you. It's just the method. How do you how do you actually get that to happen? How do you get it to happen? Well, um, partly I think. It's something that is happening by osmosis, that you, you see how society has evolved over recent decades. Um, partly, it's by ensuring that our immigration policy is fair and works and treats people well and respectfully. And, and I think that is, is fundamental. And it may be, I mean, this is one of the reasons I was very pleased we left the European Union, which wasn't going to be my main topic tonight. But I thought having a system that made it very, very difficult for family reunion from India and very easy for people to come from European countries was fundamentally unfair on people living in the UK. Mm. And so I think our ability to have an immigration policy that is fair is going to be really important in 
improving relations with the diaspora who are already here, but also with their families back in India who will feel that they're getting a fair crack of the whip. And I think that's important. No, so do I, and thank you. Um, my next question is from Councillor Charles Kelly, a very good friend of mine. Charles, I think you've got two questions, but if you could ask them very quickly, that would be very kind. And good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And lovely to see you all this evening. And Jacob, you're looking very smart as ever. <laughs> I wanted to, to lighten the subject a bit, rather than talk about EU trade and the city and the fishermen, I wanted to lighten the subject and say, as a, a very well-known leading Catholic, I'm sure you're aware that under the Act of Settlement, a Catholic cannot become prime minister, which I understand has something to do with the fact that he cannot advise the monarch who is the head of the Church of England. And Boris Johnson was baptized a Catholic, but converted to the Anglican Church when he was at Eton. But I understand that after he became prime minister, he converted back to Catholicism and actually got married. Congratulations to Boris. He got married last week in Westminster Cathedral. So would he have been unable to become prime minister had he been a Catholic before uh, the election? And I wonder if he's, if he's waited till after it to convert back. I, I just wonder if that, that act still applies nowadays. It seems a bit out of date. No, the Act of Settlement still applies, but that's the Act of Settlement for the monarchy. When the Act of Settlement was passed, the post of Prime Minister didn't exist. So there's no bar to the Prime Minister being a Catholic. There is, however, the um, Act of Catholic Emancipation, 1829, which would prohibit the Prime Minister, if a Catholic, from giving advice on appointments in the Church of England, uh, which is listed as a felony, for which the penalty is disbarment from public life. So under that act, the Prime Minister must not, if he is a Catholic, give advice on the appointment of Anglican bishops uh, or other posts that are normally advised on by the Prime Minister to the monarch. Now, as the current system established by Gordon Brown is that only one name is forwarded to the monarch by the Prime Minister, I don't think that would count as advice in terms of the act of emancipation. So I, I don't think this arises. The last post that was specifically prohibited to Catholics, other than the monarchy itself, was that of Lord Chancellor. And the law was changed uh, in the late 1970s for um, Lord Rawlinson, Peter Rawlinson, to become Lord Chancellor. But unfortunately, he then fell out with Margaret Thatcher and didn't become Lord Chancellor anyway. So the, it, the law was changed, but it didn't happen. That there are no political posts prohibited to Catholics in this country anymore. Thank you. Excellent answer. Thank you. And Major Bernard Horning. Are you there, Bernard? All right, we will come back. Um, oh, oh, I'm here. Ah, yes, yeah. go on, Bernard. All right. Good evening. Um, good evening, Carl. <laughs> Um, good evening, all, and, and, and Jacob, thank you very much indeed um, for a wonderful talk. Uh, coming from a family that lost absolutely everything at Mozambique in 1978, I know quite a bit about political risk. <laughs> um, but that apart, uh, my question to you this evening is really uh, going back to this awful virus and an acceptance that um, unfortunately, uh, the main source of infection uh, are in aerosols. And we really need to address um, the air that we breathe has to be free from infection. And that really requires airtight buildings. And most of us spend an awful lot of time um, in buildings um, and the spread of this awful virus um, during the lockdowns was principally in, in offices. Um, and I think the time um, has come to accept that unless we have air type buildings, we're not gonna have energy efficient mechanical ventilation. And we're certainly not going to have effective air purification or air filtration. Do you believe that the time has come to have mandatory, regular, frequent, and periodic testing of buildings for air tightness? Um, 
I think speaking as leader of the House of Commons and with a responsibility for a building that is never going to be airtight and the changes that you would need to it would risk changing an important historic building. Um, I think that's very difficult to do. I think it's very difficult to retrofit in that way. And the cost would be disproportionate to what you're trying to achieve. I think we're looking at two different things. One is dealing with the virus. And you're absolutely right, it is um, airborne rather than surface borne, and that has been much the bigger way of it being contracted. But there, as much as anything, you want opened windows rather than airtight buildings. So the free flow of air has been very important in dispersing the virus and all the um, uh, advice we're getting at the moment is about the safety of open air events and so on and so forth. But there's also the issue you're raising, second issue of environmental concerns and what you do in terms of efficient heating of buildings. But there I think the question has slightly moved on with the new government policies, because if the energy inputs are environmentally friendly, are renewable, then the issue is ensuring their um, capacity to heat the buildings. Now, I'm not saying you should then ignore um, anything to do with energy efficiency, but energy efficiency ceases to be the answer. Energy efficiency is really important if you're using coal-fired um, power stations and you're trying to minimize energy wastage. But if your inputs are clean, and are renewable, then the retrofitting of buildings becomes a much less important activity because what's going in is clean in the first place. And th th although you will want new buildings to be very efficient, you won't have the same pressure on you. So I don't think I'm going to agree with you that we should have mandatory testing for airtight buildings. I will however caveat that by saying that it is not a subject that I've thought deeply about until you've asked me this question. So it may be that I will need to revisit this opinion um, in future. But I, uh, my current view is that, no, I, I don't agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. But ben, Jacob, Bernard's point on that was uh, per The Economist article last week, where to ensure pathogen-free air for people in, more like buildings in Canary Wharf or in Hong Kong, if you like, where the only way that they can ensure that is to ventilate properly and then the only way you can do that is to create a modern building that's airtight. It obviously has no relevance at all to the house and I, I wouldn't make that very clear. So thank you so much <laughs> because I'm with you on the house by the way and I wish you well in your endeavours there. Um, Mr Joseph Barker Willis uh, has a question about the United States and the G7. Are you there Joseph? Thank you very much and thank you um, Mr Reesmar for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question concerns the G7 proposals for a minimum global corporate tax rate this week. Um, if I may, what impact do you think this will have on emerging markets, and in particular the British overseas territories, such as the Cayman Islands, um, which benefit from low taxation? Post-Brexit, have we merely replaced direction from Brussels with direction from Washington? Well, um, this meeting is Chatham House rules, isn't it? I think so. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it is. Well, I think a global minimum corporation.